and welcome to the Big Finish Review Show. Again, I wanted to call it a podcast. Sorry I've been away for such a long time. It wasn't the plan, it just sort of happened. Um, and there have been plenty of new releases since I was last here. However, last time I was on, I did promise that I would take a look at something from the Big Finish archive, and I don't break my promises. So today I am going to take a look at the very first ever Big Finish release. Oh no, it isn't. Uh, which was the very first release in the Bernice Summerfield range. Um, I will also be looking at uh, the short trip later on, uh, Regeneration Impossible, and the latest Eighth Doctor boxed set, Stranded Volume 1. So it's strange to think that, oh no it isn't, this release is 22 years old this year. Um, the very, very first Big Finish production was released in September 1998, and the story has quite a complicated history. Uh, in 1991, about 18 months after the final broadcast episode uh, of the original run of Doctor Who was transmitted, uh, Virgin Books released the very first original Doctor Who novel in the New Adventures range, Time Worm Genesis. Uh, they continued releasing Doctor Who books until 1997, when the BBC decided decided to take the rights back and start producing the books themselves. It was decided by the editors of the Virgin series um, early on that they wanted to create their own companion to feature in the books. So in Love and War by Paul Kernell, uh, lovingly known as Attack of the Bollock Monsters, by the way, um, which was released in October 92, they introduced a new character in the form of Bernice Summerfield. Um, a couple of friends of mine actually stopped reading the books at this point on the grounds that they did not want to read original stories featuring new companions. I don't know why. Perhaps their imaginations were too small to be able to picture a character they'd not seen on the television. I suspect that they are the same kind of people that would refuse to buy big finished material if they went to a download only distribution model. I mean, I would rather have a CD, but if it was that or nothing, I'd still buy the downloads. I'd get more pleasure out of listening to the piece than looking at the packaging. I suspect that if there was a Venn diagram comparing people who refuse to buy download-only material and people who refuse to read the virgin books that contained a new companion, it would be an almost perfect circle. Both groups seem to be willing to cut off their noses to spite their faces, never mind rant over. Uh, when Virgin lost the rights to produce Doctor Who in 1997, it was decided to continue publishing stories under the New Adventures banner, but only use characters they had the rights to. 23 books, further books were produced starring Bernie Summerfield between 1997 in 1999. I'm actually not sure why, should have done more research, not sure why uh, Virgin stopped producing the books, but from the year 2000, Big Finish attained the rights to produce new Bernie Summerfield books and audio plays. By that point, they had released six plays that were based on books in the new uh, in the Virgin New Adventures range, including some that were originally Doctor Who stories, although in the versions starring Bernice, the Doctor didn't feature in them. Um, they've been producing Bernice Summer, Summerfield Adventures every year since then. For the first 11 years, she was working for, or at least linked to, a museum called the Braxiatel Collection. Does anybody know what that's a reference to? Because that's a reference to a specific Doctor Who story in which that collection is mentioned. Um, and after that, her location changed and they made another five series where she lived on a, like a frontier planet uh, with some of the characters from the Braxiatel Collection. Uh, the next big change saw her meeting up with the Seventh Doctor for a couple of series before travelling with um, a Doctor from an alternative universe played by David Warner, which takes us up to most, the most recent box set, which was released last year. So far, there hasn't been an announcement of, of the Bernie Summerfield release for 2020. I genuinely hope she's not a, you know, a casualty of the coronavirus. The very first Big Finish production was an adaptation of the very first Virgin New Adventure after they lost the licence to produce Doctor Who material. Uh, it was called, as I said, Oh No It Isn't. Uh, the book was by Paul Connell, who, if you're Paul Connell, who, if you remember, wrote Benny's first story, Love and War, and was adapted for Binish by Jacques Rayner. Uh, unfortunately, Big Finish have never produced individual trailers uh, for the stories uh, in the first series of the run of Bernie Summerfield, but they did kind of produce a six minute compilation trailer that covered those first stories six stories. I will play the first two minutes of that trailer which covers Oh No It Isn't and the second story they recorded Beyond the Sun which I will also talk about today. Dear Diary, it's me again, Benny. Have you missed me? I've been so busy recently, you know, saving the world a few times, that sort of thing. But now the world is safe again. Oh yes it is, Woolsey. Now that takes me back. The Princess Bernice and Wolsey the Cat. Oh, walk slower, Walls. If I put my feet down too hard, these glass slippers will create a horrible ankle hemorrhaging situation. The 
king's balls get bigger every year. But it wasn't just one big party, was it? Now, look at the floor. It's a complicated pattern. But what it almost certainly comes down to is... Don't step on the white tiles. Huh. These puzzles are often deceptively simple. You see? You're getting an archaeology field trip after all. Watch the expert. As I said, it all comes down to don't step on the black tiles. You think that would have put me off field trips with my students for a while, wouldn't you? Not me. Always a glutton for punishment, I am. Although, remind me not to say that when Jason's around. He gets excited when I say the word punishment. Oh, the ship's a sitting duck. Can't you take evasive action? Evasive what? What do you think? This is a battleship. It takes 15 minutes to make a 45 degree turn. Oh my god, the screen's full of them. Do we have weapons? No. Force field, shields, anything defensive? No. Nope. What about ordinary equipment we can use as a weapon or a disguise or something? Oh, you mean like confusing their targeting systems by ejecting the cargo? Fill the space between us with millions of tons of rice grains, that sort of thing. Oh my god, Benny, yes, exactly that. Can you do it? No. Nope. My life is just one close shave. We have to go back. Don't be stupid, Bernice. We've got what we came for. We have to get this away from the sunless permanently. Bernice? Dr. Kitzinger? I know you can hear me. Bring me the visionary, or Jason dies. Oh, Jason. The king's balls get bigger every year. I had genuinely forgotten that line. Anyway, firstly, here's a little bit about Bernice herself. Although she calls herself Dr. Summerfield, she never actually received any academic qualifications. At the start of the story, she's working as a professor of archaeology at St. Oscar's University on the planet Della. Benny herself is, at the outset, a morally ambiguous character. Have I got my microphone on? I have made that mistake before. Yes, I have. You can hear me. That's all right. So Benny herself is, at the outset, a morally ambiguous character. So, for example, she has pretty much decided to have sex with one of her students when they get back to the spaceship on the way back to Della because she thinks he's cute. The story starts on the last day of a field trip to the planet Perfecton, whose entire population was wiped out five millennia ago they believe, or it is generally believed, via virus. There are some strange anomalies about the planet. It has an atmosphere that, according to science, should not be there. So it is believed there must be some remaining perfecton technology on the planet, preventing the atmosphere from escaping. In fact, the planet has been embargoed until fairly recently, when it was discovered that the sun could go supernova at any time, and so special permission was given some, for some archaeological digs to explore the remains of the planet. Once all the students and gear are back on board the spaceship, the Winton, which turns out to be an Inman-class cruiser, I kid you not, the ship is attacked by a race called the Grell. The Grell are data pirates. Uh, all they're interested in is stealing knowledge. However, at the precise moment the Grell board the ship, it is also struck by a missile that has launched from the planet Perfecton. Suddenly, all of our characters are catapulted into a very different world. Benny wakes up and discovers she's actually Dick Whittington, and her best friend is none other than her own cat, Woolsey. However, in this universe, wherever they are, Woolsey is a sentient human-sized cat, played by Nicholas Courtney, who of course Doctor Who fans will know as Brigadier Alastair Gordon Lethbridge-Stewart. Her students are represented as dwarfs, lazy, moody, laddie, gushy, bitchy, liberal and cute cute being Duran the student she decided to shag on the way home in the spaceship. Even the crew of the Winton are represented in this strange place. Lieutenant Price is the first officer, Prince Charming. Uh, sorry, Lieutenant Price, who is the first officer, is Prince Charming. And his father, the King, was actually the captain of the ship, Captain Balsam. Benny is acutely aware that she's the only person who knows who she really is until they're attacked by the data pirates, the Grell, who she soon works out also realise they're not in the real world. I can't work out what to think of, what opinion to have about this play. At nearly two hours long, it definitely needs some good old fashioned editing as there's a lot of really unnecessary material. The casting is superb though, especially Benny herself, who is played by actress Lisa Bowerman. Uh, Lisa Bowerman actually appeared as the cat lady Cara in the final televised Doctor Who story Survival, although she did spend most of her time in makeup as a cat so you don't really get to see her face. She is inspired casting in this play and her performance in making the character entertaining and engaging is absolutely the reason that they're still producing plays in this range starring her 22 years on. There are some big finished regulars amongst the cast, uh, including Nicholas, Nicholas Briggs, who plays a couple of characters. For example, he plays 
Prince Charming and the First Officer, um, as well as Benny's fairy godfather, who he plays by doing an impression of Julian Clary. Now, he's not the only gay icon deliberately referenced and re impersonated in this story. Um, the wonderful Mark Gatiss is amongst the cast, uh, playing a character called the Grand Vizier, who is definitely channeling Kenneth Williams. I don't know if the intention was for it to come across as funny, but actually 22 years after the event, it frankly smacks of being a bit camp and kitsch rather than funny. It takes Benny a little while to work out why she is in a pantomime world. And when she does, it turns out that she's basically in the plot from the Star Trek The Next Generation episode, The Inner Lights, with the serial numbers filed off. Both as a book to start off the written range and as a play to start off the audio range, it's, it's a strange choice. It doesn't have the traditional narrative. It sort of ambles from one set piece, set piece to another and things are only really explain towards the end. The sound design is a lot more primitive than you're used to hearing from Big Finish um, these days. But having read some comments online from one of the production team, and I don't remember which one, I was kind of looking out for this and expecting it. The modern approach seems to be imagine every sound that would be there as though it was on film or video, including footsteps, you know, door knocks, um, taps whatever put it all in uh, and modern big finish the sound design is outstanding and you can see here that they were just starting out because the level of detail that we're used to is not there i mean you only hear footsteps if somebody's going upstairs for example or, or there's a moment where wolsey is tap dancing it's not that it's bad it's just not anything like as complex an audio landscape as what we're used to hearing from big finish now and i also have a horrible feeling that the title of this book oh no it isn't was meant to be a joke the reader might ask when they bought this book, is this a Doctor Who book? Because because this is um, following on directly from the last new adventure containing the Doctor, where the Eighth Doctor deposits Benny on the planet Della. And this book starts with her working on the planet Doctor, uh, planet Della. Is it a Doctor Who book? Oh, no, it isn't. It's not bad. Technically, it's reasonably well put together. And like I say, the acting is great and it is lovely to hear some of these actors. Personally, I would have liked a more serious story to have been the one they launched with, though. This trauma, <laughs> OK, typo, this drama is still available. It says trauma in my script. I'm not entirely sure that isn't Freudian. This drama is still available. Sadly, none of the first 11 series of Bernie Sunfield are available as downloads and still need to be, as I've shown you before, purchased as a traditional compact disc. I believe they are all available still, so genuinely, why not head along to head along to bigfinish.com and for £4.99, get yourself a piece of Big Finish history. It's worth listening to for that reason alone. There are five more plays in what is considered the first series of Bernie Summerfield, the second of which is a story called Beyond the Sun, which I listened to immediately after listening to Oh No It Isn't. Now, Beyond the Sun is a far more complex story and, if I'm honest, far more competently put together. It looks like they've they've learned stuff from this first play before they produce this one. Once again, we start off with an archaeological expedition, but this, this time Bernice is only with two students who missed a module for some reason. So she's taken them um, to a dig so they can catch up with, with their peers in terms of coursework. Very early on, Bernice's ex-husband Jason turns up. He has an artefact that he asks her to keep. And then after they spend the nights together, because they're still fairly close as much as they both hate to admit it, he is kidnapped by people looking for that artefact. The police initially assume that there's something stolen hidden in the statue. It's like a bronze thing about this tall, if I recall. And Bernice, uh, they initially think, is his collaborator. But when that turns out not to be the case, there's nothing hidden in the statue, she is actually released without charge. The artefact comes from the planet Ursu, so Bernice cuts the exp expedition short in order to run her students home. On the way, she stops at Ursu, intending to try and initiate communications to find out more details about the artefact. Now, it's a closed world, so she cannot visit, at least not officially, and with two students in tow. However, when, however, when the vessel is shot out of the sky by a non-native craft, Bernice, Emile and Tamiko, which are the name of the two students, have to use escape pods and crash land on the planet. Now, once there, they are taken in by the local population, and they discover the planet has been invaded by aliens known only as the Sunless. Ursu was originally a colony world, and when they were a younger colony and quite technologically powerful, they ransacked the home world of the Sunless and stole devices that they then used to continue breeding their race. So rather than sexual reproduction, all new people on Ursu are created in biological looms, in batches of eight, representing each of the eight races that originally colonised the planet. The Sunless want their looms back, only it will leave the Ursulans sterile and without a way of reproducing. There is a lot I like about this play, 
but there's also a lot which I struggled with. Uh, I do re recall really enjoying the original book, so the story itself is fun, and I think the audio script is pretty good as well. This being, again, a very early, very early play in the pantheon of Big Finish, there are a few things they got wrong. The first thing is something that is usually one of their strengths, which is using the cast to play multiple characters. Um, the story is the first Big Finish appearance of Annika, Annika Wills, best known to Doctor Who fans as companion Polly from the 1960s. In this, she plays one of the midwives that operates the looms, Dr Kitzinger, but there is also a part earlier on where she plays another character. She has a lovely but distinctive voice, and putting an electronic effect on it does not in any way disguise the fact that it is her. It appears that she wasn't directed to put on any accents or attempt to change her voice in any way, and this makes the production feel cheap when she turns up a few scenes later in her main role of Dr Kitzinger. There is also a sequence in the second half where Bernice and the students steal an armoured car and there is an extremely lacklustre sounding chase sequence before they're caught. I mean, they're saying their lines and there are sound effects going on in the background, but none of it feels like it's actually happening at the same time. It's a shame because in terms of sound design, Beyond the Sun is pretty good, with an exception of this scene. Again, not like their modern stuff, but better than, than Oh No It Isn't. There are also a couple of edits in the play that are really badly done. So I'm used to a gradual fade and a short gap between scenes to indicate new scenes. Now I listen to this on headphones uh, playing on my, on my mobile phone um, and the audio fade outs when they move from scene to scene are so sudden. They actually sounded exactly the same as when my phone cuts the audio for an, for an incoming phone call. So there were a number of times that I was listening to this play that I kind of picked up my phone thinking I had an incoming call before realising it was just another kind of sudden and not very good edit. This is also the first story uh, in the audio plays to feature Jason Kane, Bernice's ex-husband, who is in fact a major character in the remaining stories of the current series and indeed for the next 10 years of the range. Normally when you introduce a character they will at least partly be the focus of the story that they're introduced in. But of course Beyond the Sun was not Jason's first story in the book range so they didn't need to do that. The result is the introduction of a major character that feels somewhat incomplete. He appears in an opening scene or two and then vanishes until the end of the story. It does not really do him justice but this is addressed quite quickly in later episodes. It also does not help that the policeman investigating Jason's disappearance is obviously the same actor but with a bad voice effect put on again. By and large, the performances are really good. Lisa Bauman has already found her character's voice, and Stephen Fuel, despite his lack of material, is great as Jason. The Ursulans are well played and interesting, and special mention must go to Barnaby Edwards, who plays Ursuline Leon. He's a character who has a bit of a strong sex drive, and Edwards plays him brilliantly without making him seem seedy. And the awkwardness of one of um, Benny's students, Emile, who is obviously gay but hasn't admitted to himself yet, uh, particularly his reaction to, to Leon, is beautifully written. It's a shame that the actor who plays Mill wasn't able to bring the words of life from the page. It's brilliant in the book, and it almost works here, thanks to Barnaby Edwards, but, but not quite because of the performance of the other actor. There's some other weird things. There's bursts of the theme tune at points throughout the story, almost as though they thought about editing it into four distinct episodes, then changed their minds at the last moment. What does work is the scale of the story. The Ursuline culture feels real and there are some great moments, for example, when Tamika recognises the, the picture of the mysterious ninth person to come out of one of the looms of eight. Uh, and she recognises her as the person Jason was photographed with earlier in the story, his so-called girlfriend Miranda, who is played with gusto by Sophie Aldred, again, her first performance with Big Finish. When this was released, we were still about 18 months away from her first appearance in the range recreating her role of Ace, and indeed still nine months away from any Doctor Who release. Most of the other cast are great, with, as I said, the sad exception of the person who played Emil. He never sounded quite like he was doing much more than reading his lines, kind of making the sexual awakening of his character one of the least enjoyable plot, point, uh, plot points, when in fact, in the book, it was one of the most enjoyable. Both of these originally two releases, original two releases are very different from the kind of stuff uh, we are used to for Big Finish now, but they're worth listening to simply because they illustrate how far the company has come, but also that they kind of hit the ground running for the most part on day one. As I said earlier, neither of these releases are available on download, but can be purchased from bigfinish.com in the UK for £4.99, um, whatever that is in your local currency of buying abroad. Unfortunately, because it is physical objects only, you'll have to pay shipping. Um, but, you know, I think they are definitely work, worth a look. Next up and the next trailer are my thoughts on May's short trips relief release Regeneration Impossible. Hello? 
I'm the doctor. I'm here to help. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. Tricky business at the best of times, regeneration, and three in the morning among a bunch of dead humans isn't anyone's idea of the best time. I hope. Look, I just wanted... Doctor Who. Short trips. Ah! You're regenerating. Oh, brilliant knee splaining. Have you done this before? <sighs> Have I done this before? How do you think you got here? Regeneration impossible. Oh, what the hell? Guess I'm stuck with you. Hello, Doctor. I'm the Doctor. And I'm dying. Big finish. We love stories. You can't be the Doctor. I'm the Doctor. The last Doctor. Oh, are you? Oh, this is awkward. I'll just sit in the corner and not exist, shall I? Right, so that was the trailer for Regeneration Impossible. It's a 40-minute drama featuring a meeting between the 11th and 12th Doctors. Um, again, let me just check I've got my microphone on because I'm rushing. No, I have. That's all right then. So for 11, it is set whilst he's living in Victorian London, sad at having lost Amy and Rory, but not having met Clara yet. For 12, he's working in the university having lost Clara and he's noticed Bill creeping into his lectures, but has not spoken to her yet. This story is a nice little character piece between the two Doctors, which also has an enjoyable continuity reference linked to the show's past. I liked it, but I have a problem with the, with the way it was presented. And here's why. The short trips range is one of the few times I think Big Finish can legitimately use the word audiobook to describe their output. Most of what they do is full cast audio drama, but the short trips tend to be read by an actor, an actor who has played a character, usually a doctor or a companion, or even a character who's appeared in the TV series, TV series or previously in a Big Finish production at some point. They're not playing that character, they're reading out a story which includes, includes lines said by the character they played. Now, this is what I assumed this story was going to be like too. Short trips have one voice, or should I say one actor in them. This story is no exception. Jacob Dudman plays both versions of the Doctor as well as the bad guy when he's identified later on in the story. He does an exceptionally good Matt Smith, almost good enough for you to forget that you are listening to somebody impersonating him. In the same way that you forget that Tim Trelaw is not John Pertwee in the third Doctor range. His Peter Capaldi, on the other hand, it's obvious it's meant to be Peter Capaldi, but it does not sound exactly like him. It sounds like someone impersonating him. Dudman has already played both of these versions of the Doctor in the Doctor Who Chronicles range, which are narrated stories, albeit ones that usually have a second cast member voicing some of the other parts. I completely accept him playing the Twelfth Doctor in those, because the actor is reading a story and putting on a voice to represent the character of the Doctor when he has dialogue. They work because I don't have to suspend disbelief in any way. Unfortunately, this short trip is not presented as a narrated audiobook. It is presented as an audio drama, but with Jacob Dudman playing all of the parts. And for me, it just doesn't work. His Matt Smith is impeccable. His Peter Capaldi isn't. And then when he starts playing the third character, you can kind of hin hear hints of both the 11th Doctor and the 12th Doctor in that third character. There's even one point where he sounds a bit like his impersonation of David Tennant, who is played in the uh, Doctor Who Chronicles range. It just doesn't work. Had this been a narrated audiobook, I would have really enjoyed it. The story is sound, and you can get over the fact that he doesn't sound exactly like Peter Capaldi because he's reading a story and he doesn't have to. Presenting it as a drama accentuates the fact that he's doing a mediocre impersonation. He gets some of the intonation right and the timing is spot on, but he doesn't sound enough like the Twelfth Doctor for you to lose yourself in it. Now, I know I'm in a minority in this view. I know this play went down exceptionally well from reading reviews online, but for me, it just doesn't cut it. Whoever made the decision to turn it into audio drama rather than an audio book, for me, made a mistake and it spoils what could have other been an entertaining 40 minutes or so, but... Don't take my word for it. Regeneration Impossible is only available to buy as a, down, a download uh, for £2.99 or whatever your local currency is. And it is good value for money. And I challenge you to listen to it and tell me why I'm wrong. Because as I said, I'm in a minority of this point of view. Everybody else loves it. 
My final review today is the latest outing for Paul McGann as the Eighth Doctor. Big Finish have done an amazing job with this otherwise forgotten incarnation. Initially a character hard to pin down because he only had 75 minutes on the television, Big Finish have been creating new material for this Doctor since 2001. Our very first release was this absolutely wonderful play, Storm Warning. Thanks to Big Finish, Paul McGann and therefore the fans know exactly what his version of the Doctor sounds like and how he will react in most situations. His reappearance in the 8 minute 50th anniversary episode, The Night of the Doctor, featured the character we know from the performances Big, uh, Paul McGann gave for Big Finish. It did not need him to name some of the companions from the audio range for this to be the case, although that was a lovely touch. From initially being a relatively unknown quantity in the history of the show, Paul McGann has created a lovable version of the Doctor who stands shoulder to shoulder amongst the others who had more time on television, and it's all thanks to the guys from Big Finish. His era falls into three distinct phases. The first was when he travelled with travelling companion um, uh, Charlotte Pollard, the Edwardian adventuress. Uh, the second was when he travelled with Lucy Miller, who was on a kind of Time Lord witness protection programme. Um, they were forced together, not through the choice of either of them. The third, which is the current one and one that's lasted a long time, is the era immediately after the death of Lucy Miller. Spoilers! Characters have come and gone, but there has never been a distinctive stop where all of the characters left the Doctor at the same time, leaving him travelling alone. This has led to some criticism that this era has been a little difficult to jump into if you haven't listened to the previous plays. Now, I don't agree with that, and I, but I would also argue that this month's release, Stranded Volume 1, is a very good place to start if you haven't listened to the other box sets. You don't need to know the backstory of the previous 48 episodes. There is enough work done to tell you who his current companions are without it ever feeling like an info dump. So here is the trailer for the 8th Doctor Adventures Stranded Volume 1. From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Eighth Doctor Adventures, Stranded, Volume 1. She used every ounce of her strength to escape the Crucible. No control, no navigation. Instinct brought her to her second home, Earth. Then she gave up the ghost. You're saying you own a house? Oh, this place! Isn't this Baker Street? Expensive area. Number 107. I made the investment a long time ago. Hello? Can I help you? Yes. What are you doing in my house? The past few days, everyone's becoming more paranoid that there could be someone or something else in the house. The idea of spending the rest of my life here. There are worse places to live than planet Earth. The TARDIS isn't responding at all. Well, we knew it'd be difficult. I really think I might not get her back. Doctor, Liv's been shot! I thought it was safe here, but we've lived our lives so dangerously for so long that we've forgotten death lurks everywhere. Driving a car, walking the street, working in a shop. A police box on Camden Road. I'm old enough to remember what this was really used for. Big finish. We love stories. But if we're going to be stuck here a while, we might as well give the walls a lick of paint. I'm a Time Lord. I don't do up kitchens. So there you have it, the trailer to Stranded uh, Volume 1. Now on paper, this series didn't sound like a great idea. Um, the uh, TARDIS is not working and the Doctor is stranded in London in the year 2020. It's not like in the 1970s when he was working for UNIT. On this occasion, he has no affiliations and just has to make life work the hard way. The TARDIS has crash landed on Earth. The interior dimensions are folding up on themselves and the Doctor, Liv and Helen are lucky to make it out of the damaged time vessel with their lives. Only the shell is left. They have no access to the interior of the TARDIS at all. Uh, it just looks like an empty police box. So they have no technology, no sonic screwdriver, no psychic paper, nothing. If the TARDIS had stopped working but was still intact dimension, as it were, they could still have lived there. But they cannot. Now, the Doctor owns a house on Baker Street. Whilst it's never mentioned in the television series, it has been visited by various Doctors uh, over the years in Big Finish Adventures. The fourth, fifth and seventh Doctors have stayed there, and I think even River Song has, take advantage, has taken advantage of the property at some point. So, naturally, the Doctor, with his companions in tow, head there, only to find that a young rascal, Thomas Brewster, again, someone who has appeared in earlier stories featuring the fifth and sixth, sixth Doctors, has for some reason had the large house 
divided into flats. There's still space for the Doctor and the companions to live, but they have to join a plethora of other people in the property. There's an elderly gay couple, Ron and Tony, who might also be a little bit racist, um, but tolerate Asian sisters Aisha and Zakir, who also have one of the other flats. Uh, flat number one, there's Tanya Bell, a trans woman, and a father and son make up the final residence. Now, there will be people out there, particularly the people who object to Jodie Whittaker being cast as the Doctor because of her gender, who will moan and moan that this sounds just like a load of old woke nonsense, that the tenants just tick a politically correct list. Now, if you do think that, then you might as well stop pretending to be a Doctor Who fan, because I think you may have missed the message of the show. The characters are wonderfully portrayed. There are scenes in episode one where various tenants are yelling at each other through the hall whilst the Doctor's trying to concentrate on other things, and it drives him absolutely potty. But crucially, all of these tenants feel like real people. Not every character is in every episode, although the majority of them appear in most. It's a really interesting setup for this and the subsequent three box sets, which, if the usual pattern is adhered to, will end up running to a total of about 16 episodes. What's even better is there are no major science fiction threads until episode three. The Doctor is stuck on modern day Earth, although without the coronavirus, so it's clearly a parallel universe, and caught up in real situations. The tenants aren't very happy because the repairs haven't been done to the house for the last few years. They stay simply because it's very cheap, and worse, the Doctor needs the money for him, his com for him and his companions to live. But he doesn't want to incre increase the rent because it means that most of them will end up moving out. It's the real world. The companions are having to sell property to get enough money to, for food at the beginning. They're borrowing other people's oyster cards to get around on public transport. It's a very down-to-earth and realistic setup that you've never seen in Doctor Who before. And also, it features the all-time iconic line from the trailer, I'm a Time Lord, I don't do up kitchens. Episode 1, which is called Lost Property and is written by Matt Fitton, introduces this new setup to the audience. It also introduces a strange old man, voiced by Tom Baker, who's hanging around the shell of the TARDIS uh, where it was left at Camden Market. This is the same character that appeared in a single scene at the end of the televised 50th anniversary special, The Day of the Doctor, and he's known as the curator. We believe that he's a later incarnation of the Doctor, which kind of makes more sense given the revelations in the latest television series. He knows that something big is coming for this younger version of himself and spends quite a bit of time pulling strings to make sure that things he needs to survive are there, but without directly getting involved. There are no scenes between Paul McGann and Tom Baker, although Liv does, does run into the curator on a number of occasions. The first episode is chaotic, but brilliant. It introduces, introduces all the new characters and sets the scene for the rest of the series. This is a very different version of the Eighth Doctor compared to what we've seen before. He's going slightly crazy and feels totally impotent thanks to the situation. Episode two exacerbates this. There is a minor science fiction element in episode one, but none at all in episode two, Wild Animals by John Dorney, and it's just as good. What, what with the Doctor still uh, struggling to find his new role in things and going a little bit crazy in the meantime, Liv and Helen have found jobs. Liv is working in a local convenience store and Helen is teaching history to a few people, including Robin Bright Thompson, who lives with his father in one of the other flats. There is a robbery in the convenience store uh, in which both Liv and the shop owner are shot. The shop owner sadly dies and the Doctor is desperate to do something to help Liv but spends his entire time getting in the way of and completely annoying the local police. He has his little theories about how to catch the killer and I won't say if he does or not but the answer is kind of unusual for Doctor Who and goes to underline the difference of the setup and situation in these stories. I love episodes one and two, they are absolutely brilliant. Episode three is my least favourite, but it's it's still pretty good. It's called Much Watch TV and is by Lisa McMullen and features a new character moving into one of the empty flats who's a little bit odd. In fact, he seems to be deliberately inserting alien technology into the electronic devices of the other people in the house, enabling them to watch each other in their rooms on TV, for example. But he then accuses the Doctor of having done it and tries to sow seeds of distrust and suspicion amongst the already fractious tenants. The best bit of this episode is the introduction of Tom Price as PC Andy from Torchwood. I did wonder how they would be able to use that character without it feeling contrived in any way, but they absolutely do manage. He still is working for Torchwood and knows he cannot allow this earlier incarnation of the Doctor to find out about the organisation. It also appears that another, another member of the household is feeding Torchwood information, which is really interesting. In the final episode, we have a proper alien threat. Divine Intervention is by David K. Barnes and it has this title for a number of reasons, one of which is dangled but not followed up. There is a group called Divine Intervention who recruit members in a way that seems rather similar to Scientology um, and these guys seem to take an unhealthy interest in young, Robert Bright Tom young Robin Bright Thompson who is struggling with life because his dad is never around because of work commitments. 
There are some aliens who wish to kill the Doctor because of something he will do in the future. It's interesting stuff, and various member of the, members of the household find more out about the Doctor than I, don't th than I think he'd want them to know. It's very interesting and set things up nicely for an explosive second box set. As you can probably tell, I adore this release. The new characters are very interesting. The standout newcomer is Rebecca Root as Tanya Bell. I'm very pleased that Big Finish cast a trans actor playing a trans character, although as a company, I do believe that they are genuinely ahead of the curve with, with social issues such as this. She is a really interesting character. There is more than a hint of romance between her and Liv, which... I guess the anti-work brigade will absolutely hate, but I really enjoyed. There's been some talk in the press of Tanya Bell being the first legitimate trans companion. I'm not completely sure I agree with that. She's definitely a regular on the series and is the first trans regular, but she's no more of a companion than the Brigadier or Sergeant Benton were. They were regulars on the show, but they never travelled repeatedly in the TARDIS, unless, of course, the reviewers know something I don't about what happens in the future of this series. She may become a companion, who knows? PC Andy is still working for Torchwood and it will be interesting to find out what their involvement is and also who actually is in Torchwood these days. Last time we saw them um, they are almost disbanded um, in the official sixth series as produced by Big Finish and of course there have been references to the fact that Torchwood doesn't exist anymore in the recent TV series. Uh, it's really obvious that the cast are having a great time here and Paul McGann has spoken openly of how much he enjoyed playing this new take on the Doctor, a man who doesn't really know what his function is anymore and where he fits in. Stranded Volume 1 is different from anything you've heard before. It has a visceral realness um, to it that I don't think we've ever seen in Doctor Who before. The first series of the new run from 2005 got the closest with the earthbound characters like mickey and jackie but this takes the whole concept of real life and consequences to a new level paul mcgann as always is fantastic as a doctor who feels helpless in his surroundings getting more and more miserable and starting to believe that he will never get the tardis working again but then still having moments where he is the doctor even when that doesn't serve him particularly well especially the reaction from the local police of his, of his efforts to help them in episode two I am glad they introduced a science fiction element in the final story because I think four episodes set purely in the real world would probably have been a little hard to take in. But what they do is subtle and tangible and real. There are loads of questions that haven't been answered, which means I will be absolutely fascinated to hear the, Nox, the next box set when it comes out next year. That's a long time. In the meantime, I will listen to these again. Not something I do with every box set, but this one I feel like I have to because it's just that damned good. And that's it. Uh, thank you for watching. I will be back later in the month with more archive and reviews of new Big Finish items. Sorry I haven't done this for nearly a month. Um, it's just the way things have panned out. And I'm not going to set a specific date for the next one, just in case I can't meet that deadline. Um, but I will be back at some point with reviews of the latest Torchwood, Doctor Who and other Big Finish, finish releases. Thank you so, for, so much for watching. Goodbye.